My heart sings a brand new song. The debt is paid, these chains are gone. Emmanuel, God with us. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. Nevertheless, lay it at your feet. Such a tiny offering compared to Calvary. Nevertheless, lay it at your feet. Dave, would you open with prayer? Thank you. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that your presence here is among us, and we ask that all that we learn, Lord, today, we give back to you so we can be filled with your love and compassion and our dependency on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Dave. We are continuing our study of growing spiritually. It's a study that has just really benefited me in my understanding of how to grow closer to Jesus and how to become more aware of the process of growth. A spiritual discipline, which actually um, Larry again was talking about this morning, he kind of has been following in the same pattern that I have been in in, in many ways. A spiritual discipline is an activity you engage in to be made more fully alive by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit in your life. And so uh, this, is, this is an important concept to understand, but uh, this is not the same as just feeling good in the moment or having an inappropriate gratification such as consuming too much alcohol or eating too much food or being insensitive to those around you. And so the things that bring us spiritually alive do not always feel comfortable. And confessing our sin, um, uh, giving our money are, are two good examples of that. Sustainable spiritual growth occurs when I want to do what I ought to do. Ought is one of those words that kind of comes out of the old English. But you know what ought means. Sustainable spiritual growth, the type of growth that continues to perpetuate itself, is when I want to do what I ought to do. <laughs> and how do we bridge that gap? Let me pose that. I believe that part of that answer lies in the definition of what we believe we ought to do or should do. So we have, to, we have to have a concept of what we ought to do, what we should do, before we can determine if it's lining up with what we want to do. And then hopefully we want to do it, because we ought to do it. Ought and want should be synonymous. What makes this activity spiritual is not the activity itself, but rather it is whether I do it with and through the Spirit. It is the quality and interaction with God and the Holy Spirit when I do it that determines if it will produce sustainable spiritual growth. So now, having given you some of that introduction, how do we bridge that gap? Uh, wouldn't you love it if, if when you're raising children, they would do what they ought to do because they want to do it? Wouldn't that be close to a miracle. Well, guess what? We're the same way. So, so here we are. The definition, we want to do what we ought to do. How do we bridge that gap? How do we bring those two together? What do you think? You take me right to Romans 7. And uh, the thing that really makes me feel comfortable there, even though it's very uncomfortable to read, is because the Apostle Paul went through all that. He used the first person. 
and everything that he wanted to do, he didn't do. <laughs> and everything he did, he hated. And he went on and on and on. But the thing that really clinched it for me was Romans 8, 1. Uh, <laughs> now, I can't remember. Anyway, Someone find he, he ends, I'm not, I'm not through yet. He ends his uh, problem going back and forth from yes and no to I thank my God who giveth me the victory. And then the victory is in Romans 8.1. There is therefore now no condemnation. The slate is wiped clean. Mm -hmm. And if we can live in that, it can bring us out of some of those nosedives that we all suffer. So Carolyn, are you saying we can't ever do what we ought to do? No, we can't, not in ourselves. <laughs> okay, not in ourselves. Okay. Not in ourselves. He okay. says, I thank my God who giveth me the victory. It's not mine, it's his. Yeah, cool. Did you have Romans 8, 1? Oh. So Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Yeah, I think she's read her Bible before, once or twice. <laughs> Someone else. How can we do what we ought to do and actually want to do it. So I guess I'm just thinking about the, the issue of free will and making a choice to do what I, what I ought to do. And there, you know, I, okay, so I have a habit of, like, I do like to read my Bible on a daily basis. And there's some days I get up and I just am not feeling it. But then there's a place of thinking, Okay, I may not be feeling it, but I know there's something in there that I may need to hear or need to read. So um, I guess I just make a conscious choice to, to do the things that I know will edify me and help me in my walk. So that becomes a discipline. One of the things I like to do is go to football games, and uh, when I get in the stadium, uh, boy, I tell you, I tell the coach how to play the game. I, uh, I tell the other team how to get out of the, the there and give me the ball. And uh, so when when uh, when I participate in something, uh, I try to have a fullness of person, and. and Oftentimes I embarrass people because I cheer at the wrong time or I, uh, I, I send the wrong play into the players. But when I come to church, it's the same way. I, I, I'm excited to be here. Uh, I'm excited to have <laughs> no privilege to be here. I'm just as rotten as I was before I came in the door. And, but I get excited to participate and what the Lord tells me will give me comfort and peace. And the peace that passes all understanding is, is the only reason that I come. Mm -hmm. um, expanding on what Carolyn said about Romans 7, um, the last few verses say, Paul is saying, so I find this law at work. When I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind <clears throat> and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in the sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Let me pull a little bit of this together. 
I'm often reminded of Theology 101, there's a God and I'm not him. And this is the beginning of wisdom. That looks like bad news because I would like to run things. Now, Becky believes that I'm a controlling person. So I have to work hard on that. And after 39 years of marriage, trying to convince her that if she would just comply with what I say, that our marriage would be perfect, has had little or no impact. Uh, any thoughts on why she has been so unreasonable? Uh, maybe we'll pass on that one. The oldest temptation on the planet is to be like God. Adam and Eve were the first to be tempted and fall. However, real life begins when I die to the false God that is me. And the toughest decision for me, and probably for all of us, is to surrender to God. Even when we're not sure what to do, we can place our decision in God's hands. So when we're thinking about how we can do what we ought to do and want to do it, one of the keys that I believe opens the door is surrender. So how do we follow the Lord where he leads and surrender ourselves to him and place our decisions in his hands? What does that look like? What does it look like to surrender? What does that look like in a person's life? This is a tough concept. This is a concept where we need more practice. What do you think? What do you think that looks like? To surrender. I guess the word that comes to mind is humility and walking in humility and, and having the desire to want to seek him. And I just know for me personally, there's a place of needing to walk in humility and desire to seek his, his will. How do you know if you're humble? Um, because there's a place for me of knowing what it is that I'm wanting and what I'm hoping that the Lord wants to. <laughs> um, so I guess, I don't know if I can describe it. I, I just know it's a hard attitude for myself and there's a place where I'm just aware of when the Lord is, is giving me a check and giving sure. me a, um, um, yeah, there's just a place of knowing if I'm walking in the right-hearted attitude. And if Is there I'm, ever a danger of being proud of your humility? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I am just baiting you. I appreciate your answer. Excellent. Thank you. Any other thought on this concept of surrender? You're so deep in thought, I know you're just really deep. And you've got these wonderful thoughts that are ready to come out. Or you're so numb from turkey, you can't think at all. In my life, it seems like it's brokenness that leads to surrender. And when your knees are broke or your legs are broken, you go down on your knees. And when you live year after year just clinging to, you know, the hope of Jesus Christ. Uh, surrender's not too hard, because I'm surrendering to the supreme being who's, you know, kept me alive, kept me walking, you know, kept me, and so I, that, that's, when you've lost everything, surrender's mm -hmm. very easy. You can put your hands up and say, uncle, easily to God. When we recognize that we can't do it, yeah. Well, when, when I get into situations where I'm making judgments, I'm, I try to go back to God and I'm saying, what is God trying to do in this? Mm -hmm. What is God trying to do in this? I know what I'm doing and it ain't any worth anything, but what is he trying to do? Sure, great. The bottom line is when we surrender, we are no longer in charge anymore. Jesus was very clear on this point. There's no way to come close to God without surrender. Surrender is not the same thing as passivity. Living for God is taking initiative and being very engaged in life. 
Surrender does not mean being a doormat. It does not mean that we accept circumstances fatalistically. It does not mean that we won't have doubts, that we are to stop asking questions, or that we will be, in, be compliant with whatever anyone says. So now, what is surrender? What does it look like now? Do you have any new thoughts as a result of that? I mean, you're, in my view, you are really close, but we haven't quite hit the target I'm looking for, so let me pursue it a little more. Surrender is the glad acknowledgement that God is in charge and that it is not me that is in charge. Just think about that now. It is the glad acknowledgement. So glad, you know what that means. That's not the cleaning stuff. This is what I'm talking about, the, the type of joy that you have, the peace that Dr. Bill was talking about that we have inside of us. The glad acknowledgement, and acknowledgement is the recognition of it. The glad acknowledgement that God is in charge and it is not me that is in charge. Now once you get to that point, a lot of things begin to get focused and fall into place because we're always trying to move things in a direction and force them and make sure that we're in charge. Now it's not passivity. There's a difference. It is where I take myself out of the center of the universe and place God there. I yield, offer obedience, and here's the secret. I do what God says. Basically, I, Norm, am self-centered, self-promoting, selfish, and I need the scripture. That's where I find out what God says. The prompting and conviction of the Holy Spirit and all of you, including Becky, to help me recognize that God is in charge and I am not in charge. It's the scripture that gives us the ought. And it's our heart surrendering that gives us the want. Am I making sense? Why is it that our own sin is often not recognized by us? How do we accept our responsibilities and not be in charge? And I've seen this not just with us, but I have, as a superintendent of schools, for all the time that I was a principal for eight years and a superintendent of schools for all those years, 22, I saw parents who just couldn't see the faults in their own children. They couldn't do it. It was like, now I came from a philosophy having taught um, high school students before I became an administrator, that they all lie. That was kind of my conclusion. And I mean, that's a little harsh, but they did. They all lied, especially when they got in trouble. They would lie. Even really good kids would say, well, you know, it wasn't really me. You know, I'm going, you liar. I didn't say that, but it was like, now I have to prove it, and that was hard, and they don't want let you use lie detectors, and it was, got complicated. So here we are. Parents can't see what's going on in their own children's lives. And then, um, after my children got out of high school, I started to find out about them that I never knew. And I was totally blind. And I thought, oh, duh, should have seen that one coming, right? Now, that same thing is true with us. We can't see ourselves very well. Why is that? Why can't we just see it? even when we want to? This is a question. What do you think? What's your conclusion? I don't know, but when you talk about surrender, total surrender, that kind of all ties in with the joy in the Lord that we spoke about last week. Mm -hmm. But I think as adults, too, we lie. You know, as soon as we're doing something that we, that doesn't follow the Lord's ways, then we come up with an excuse as to why we're doing it, which is outside of surrender, because it's not God's will. Mm -hmm. I might have to start assigning the back pews here, because you guys sit in the back and you never talk. I have to figure out. 
I think the reason that we don't see our own faults is because of vanity. Hmm. De define that a little bit. Well, we have this self-pride and we look at all the others and we can see their faults. But because of our vanity, we don't see our own. And there's this measuring stick that people use and uh, measure the good and the bad. And of course, everybody else is worse. Yeah. So therefore, we're not that bad. Mm. When truly, if we looked at ourselves, we might find that we're much worse log in our own eye. Exactly. Yeah. Dan? Sorry, Bill. <clears throat> well, I, I would say at 91, I can tell you that life is like a belch. When, what, whatever happens, you don't have anything to do about it. it, it you're embarrassed when it happens. The other end is even worse. <laughs> on that, I'm going to move on before someone else speaks. <laughs> How many of you have ever reset your computer or booted it up when it was having trouble? Yeah. That's one of the first things they say. Did you, did you boot it up? Did you reboot? Because something wasn't working. You needed, to, you needed to start from scratch again. Now, this summer, I found myself doing just that. I did what I normally do when I talk with Becky in an in-depth discussion. Um, I wrote a six-page thesis on my analysis of what was wrong and my remedy on how to fix it. A single space, 12 font. I concluded that my relationship with God and with Becky was not what it should be and that I wanted to reboot and, and here's what I concluded. I should try softer instead of trying harder. And I want to just define that a little bit. As a general rule, the, the more you work to control things, the more you lose control. The harder you try to hit a golf ball, and I've had experience with this, the more your muscles tense up, and the more likely you are to hit it in the woods or in the water or hit someone else. I mean, that's just the way it is. And you have to be smooth, you have to be relaxed, and the power is in the centrifugal force. It's not in the muscle. It's not in muscling it. It's so counterintuitive. The more you try to impress someone, the less of an impression you make that is positive. And the more you cling to people, the more they're apt to push you away. I mean, it's just, it's just this is kind of... These are things that happen that we often don't see. Later in life, we begin to recognize them more. For some things, trying harder will work. But for deeper change, trying harder does not put us in the flow of positive change. To try harder not to worry, to try harder to be joyful or relax, you need to try harder to relax. Or to try harder not to break something when you have a tendency to drop things. It, it just doesn't work very well. These are limits, or there are limits on what trying harder can accomplish. In the Gospels, those who thought they were working the hardest for Jesus were the ones who got in the most trouble with Jesus for trying to work hard. They were trying so hard to be good they could not stop thinking about how hard they were trying. <laughs> Look at me, Grandpa. That's what I get from my three-year-old granddaughter. Look at me. That's kind of what, how we are sometimes. The problem with trying harder is that too often we get fixated on our own effort. And we become judgmental of those who are not putting forth the same effort. Just what you were saying. We compare ourselves. So in my reboot thesis, I committed to Becky that I would begin immediately to look for ways to enjoy her and God by just being with them more and including them in what I do. I said I would take God with me wherever. And as Becky and I reflected on what it might be to try softer 
in our relationship rather than trying harder in our relationship and with others in our relationship with God, it, it began to make sense. And I hope it makes sense to you. Think about trying softer. As you reflect on what it might look like, I would ask that you share your thoughts and comparisons of working harder versus working softer. What would that look like in a person's life? How would you describe working softer as you approach this concept of growing spiritually? How can you work softer? Is, is, this, is this resonating at all? Does it make sense? It's pretty scary when I see that glazed look out there. That deer in the headlights look is the teacher's worst nightmare. I think part of it might be giving yourself room to fail, room to not be perfect, um, maybe to say have low expectations of yourself is a little too far, but um, mm -hmm. I, I think that's part of it. If you don't expect yourself to always do what's right or to always be perfect, when you don't, it's not going to put you in a tailspin and make you try to work harder. So Mark, when we're trying, when we're, when we're looking at our, what we ought to do and maybe the disciplines of life and so forth, how do we balance being a disciplined person for the Lord so that we, um, I don't know how else to say it, but that, that we're disciplined and yet we're softer with ourselves. Is it, how do we reconcile that? How, how does that blend? To me, I think you, you do your best to be disciplined. You do desire to do the right thing and do your best with God's help to do the right thing. But when it fails, it, it, it's dependent upon your expectation of yourself, whether or not that's going to, um, how you're going to respond to that. Yeah. So you don't beat yourself up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You recognize that God accepts you for who you are. So when I think of working softer, I think of grace you can have with yourself and with others. And so, you know, I get the great fortunate experience of having 10 children who want things controlled in different ways. <laughs> and so um, rather than maybe looking at being right, looking for the opportunity in a situation to find the newness or the other person's perspective mm -hmm. or seeing things in another way allows you to view life, I think, in a softer way and appreciate people's differences and um, just opinions and approaches, and you can love life more that way, I think. But I was always, when younger, like, quite a perfectionist, so that's a, just a journey I've had to go on where I think God probably gave me 10 children to change me, mm -hmm. not to take care of them so much, probably. Mm -hmm. A child is self-centered and selfish, and that's what I am still at 91. And I think that, that what you're talking about is no longer being selfish and self-centered. Uh, I'm being afraid and in not enjoying what God has given us and wants us to do. And we all know what it is, and that it's getting out of self-centeredness and being selfish and afraid, and his grace is good enough for all of us. I want to build a little bit on what Mark was saying, and, and uh, those are excellent thoughts, all of them, but the expectation is really critical here. And if you don't have an expectation of someone else, you don't get angry with them as a rule. It's when you set an expectation that they should do what you think they should do where the frustration begins. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't have any expectations, but I'm just telling you that there's a barometer there where if it gets too high, your expectation where if you, and, and you can even sometimes beg the question, as they say, by having an expectation that someone will do something and then waiting for them to do it. Aha! I knew you were going to do that. In your mind. In your mind. And, and, and sometimes you'll know, I know my uncle coming for Thanksgiving is a jerk. You just watch. He'll do something. And you watch for it. And you find it. And that's not okay. Your expectation needs to change. And you need to understand maybe who they are and 
maybe perhaps recognize why they're that way and try to figure that out and establish a relationship with them where they're at as opposed to where you think they should be. And then maybe in establishing the relationship where they're at, they can come a little closer to where you think maybe they would be beneficial in, in being that way. Well, you just covered a lot of what I was just going to say. You can repeat but, it. Um, I think trying softer really means to relax in God's grace. Mm -hmm. We've just got to not be so pent up, just relax in his grace and believe. Yeah. Now, if he's in charge and you can give him that, then a lot of things come into focus. Right there, what you said there, letting him be in charge, and I think being spontaneous is the word that I think of. When I think of working harder, we plan so many things and then we build our lives around this is what I'm going to do and this is when I'm going to do it and this is how I'm going to do it. Yeah. And then when things come into our minds spontaneously, well, wait a minute, that doesn't fit in my plan. <laughs> um, and I think we need to just kind of back down and let and listen to what those things that God are tell, God's telling us to do and be more spontaneous and listen to that. That's what I think of being softer and that's hard for me too because I want a plan and I, this is my plan and this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to work hard at it. I can't tell you what a joy my children are to me, and I can't tell you what a joy our youngest child, Janessa, is to me. Uh, not that she's any more special than the other two, but she's just a joy. I just love being around her. She's fun, exciting. She's always been the kind of person who loves to sing with me, but the other two are more athletic. And uh, one of my famous statements, because I'm the master goal planner, you know, I'm the one that writes down the goals and sets the timelines and so forth, was when uh, Becky told me we were expecting our third child, I said, well, I hope you're happy. <laughs> it wasn't in my plan. You ever heard of such a horrible thing in your life? You can't, and I have talked with her father about that, and his statement is, you can't unring the bell. <laughs> when you're stupid, you're just stupid, right? And, I, and, and you have to live with those things. And she's wonderful. I mean, what a blessing. What a stupid thing to say. Now, what causes that? We're talking about if you're a parent, the unexpected is the expected. So anyway, I probably shouldn't have even shared that, but uh, I am stupid. Can't unring the bell. Can't unring the bell, Mark. Now it's out there on YouTube. We are in, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Carol. The word expectation and expectancy, they're not two t things, they're not one thing, they're two things. The expectation is what you have for yourself as well as the way you see yourself in regard of other people. Hmm. In expectancy, it's what you know already is to be, and you are looking forward to it. Oh, that's an interesting insight. So when, when you look at it that way, yeah. you're looking at God. Yeah, right. And, and the expectancy that the Word of God has given you. But when you look at yourself and you look at other people as well, you get into the habit of judging, mm. which we cannot do. Right. And we end up turning on ourselves and we judge ourselves as well. Mm. Very insightful. Excellent. We're in a spiritual river flowing with the Spirit of God in us, and we do not have to do the paddling. <laughs> Becky and I did not have to paddle down the Yahara River on our anniversary this summer when we took a very romantic canoe ride from Stebbinsville to Fulton. It was awesome. Because the current moved us along. A river of spiritual water is available but the river is not us. Faith does not need for us to paddle in the river or push the river because faith is the trust that there is a river with current flowing in the right direction. The river is flowing and we are in it. Trying softer means focusing more on God's goodness than on our efforts. It means being more relaxed and less self-conscious, just what you've been saying. 
It means feeling less pressured to perform or do the right thing and more sensitive to my surroundings and the feedback of others. I stay patient if things do not turn out the way I expect or want them to. Um, what Mark was saying before about expectancy and, and uh, some, sometimes how we expect things from others. And I was thinking it's almost genetic that there are certain things that we are less apt to be able to do. Talents, gifts. And I, the, the parents that I observed when I was working who were coaches, I knew them a lot of times because I had been in the business long enough to have seen them when they were younger. They were horrible athletes, just horrible. But their expectation of their children were that they were going to become professionals. It was just ridiculous. And they would yell at them and scream at them, how come you can't do that? I'm teaching you. Well, perhaps you were teaching them, but I was thinking to myself, but you, you were pitiful. And here you are expecting your child to be wonderful. Come on, give them a break. Cut them some slack. And the same thing is true when we're watching. Sometimes we can watch professional athletes and say, well, that was the stupidest thing. Can't believe they didn't catch that. Try catching it one time when you got a 300 pounder coming down your throat. I mean, come on. And we get kind of like that. We get like that. It means less self-congratulations when I do well and less self-criticism when I fall down. That's softer. It means asking God for help. When I try harder, I'm thinking about how great I'm doing and how good I am. <laughs> Trying softer is not thinking about me and my progress. And it is enjoying the relationship with God and with others. True growth always goes in the opposite direction of self-righteousness. If we apply this concept of trying softer to our own lives, what would it look like? What can we do that would jumpstart this approach to spiritual growth? How do we flow with the current in the river of spiritual water? Now, you've kind of been digging around it a little bit, but you, you know, you're, you got the trench dug, but you're not quite there where you've struck water. What can we do to jumpstart it? If you were going to jumpstart trying softer, what would you do? Because this is really an application for all of us. I'm not doing this just to hear myself talk up here. I want you to find something here that's useful in your life. So how would we jumpstart this? What could we do? It starts with talking to God. Okay, it begins with communication with God. It, and the next thing after talking with God is then listening to him. And I guess the jump started, it would be just listening for that first thing that comes into my, my mind that he's saying, do this, and then doing it, rather than saying, oh, that's not my plan. So you're talking about scripture? You're talking about? I, w whether you're reading the scripture or whether just, it, you know, he's just talking in your head. Being things, sensitive, being, listening being to the Holy Spirit. Listening, yes, to the Holy Spirit and those thoughts that come into your head, yep. Yeah, if you're immersing yourself in the word, there will be things that will just kind of blend together. And all of a sudden, you kind of know what you ought to do. It's kind of common sense. Well, I know all of that is important, and that's the first step. But for me, I would also... Um, realistically want to be successful. So I would probably focus on someone that would be easy to um, try softer with so that I could be successful the first time and then move that into other areas. Um, you know, maybe it's a coworker, could be someone in the family, but um, I think we have to feel success in the things we do too. Mm -hmm. Great. 
Go ahead, you first. Go ahead, Bill. Go ahead, Bill. I loved your expression of your wife and your canoe ride because as a sailor, I learned to watch the clouds and the sun and to see what was going to happen to the winds as I sailed. And when you're a sailor in the ocean or any place, I took my wife out for a ride in uh, San Diego past the limits of the, where the sailboat was to go. We went by a buoy and a big old seal looked down at her. <laughs> and she says, where are you going? I said, I don't know, but wherever the wind's taking us. <laughs> I think that uh, to go softer, you need to take uh, time to respond. Don't jump into something before you think. Mm. Uh, in other words, just be slower to respond. Great, great thought. Softer often is slower. Especially when you're responding some, to something where it might raise your blood pressure, pressure a little bit. <laughs> I had such a wonderful Thanksgiving. I probably had the best Thanksgiving of my life. It just, I made two turkeys, they both turned out okay. My, my father-in-law always teases me about my Vesuvius turkeys because sometimes they're black. I do them on the grill. Uh, they still taste okay, but you got to grind off all that carcinogen stuff. And this year they were perfect, so it was really good. And I think about the relationships that we have sometimes at these festive activities, and the tension can be high when you get all those relatives together uh, because they don't always blend nice and neat. Did somebody have their hand? Oh, you're just telling me five minutes. Okay. All right. Any other thoughts on how to try softer? I really want you to try this. I really want you to think about this concept and try it, apply it to your own life. And, and I would really encourage you to be kinder and more gentle with yourself. I think we often are so critical of ourselves. And as Christians, there's so many things that tug and pull at us, and guilt is a terrible thing, and it gets in the way of our relationship with God, and it gets in the way of our relationship with others. We can feel guilty about so many. There's a lot of, there's a lot of ways that we can find guilt in our life, and we need to kind of give it up, give it to God. If you've got to make some changes, make some changes. If you have to do something different, do something different. Don't continue in the same pattern so that you always have to feel guilty and then change and feel guilty and then change. Cut, cut it out. And we know that sometimes we're going to fall repeatedly over the same bad habits or the same problems. But over time, be gentle with yourself. Ask forgiveness. Ask God to help you. Get into the flow of the Spirit. Don't paddle like crazy. Let him do the guiding and see if that doesn't help. Anyway, it's been a joy. We've got two more classes to go. Uh, so next week I'm going to cover just a little bit more material because I know how much I want to cover in the next two classes. But, but we'll get there. So thank you. Have a good week. Lord, you know our hearts these don't deserve glory. Still you show a love we cannot afford. Black hinges straining from the weight My heart no longer can keep from singing And all that is within me cries For you alone be glorified Emmanuel, God with us My heart sings a brand new song The debt is paid, these chains are gone Emmanuel, God with us